So we have four cows, so please give us four names. And he said, Chintamani one, Chintamani <laughs> three, Chintamani four. <laughs> so I think Prabhupada's vision is cows are Chintamani, <laughs> wish fulfilling animals <laughs> who could fulfill all the desires of the devotees' needs and also the spiritual. The presence of the cows would be you know, auspicious. So this is how we, you know, things were quite easy and simple. The farm was divided into three places. There was the main farm, which we called Gohulaban, and that's where when you would drive down the road, everyone would go there. But behind that, in a little distance away in the woods, there was the Brahmachari farm. Of course, when I came there, it was a Brahmacharini farm. It was just ladies living there at that time. I was in the early part of 1973, and that lasted for some time, and then later on it became the Brahmachari farm in the beginning of 74. So that's where I spent most of my time, along with, I guess Maharaj will explain his experiences. But we were together there, and uh, everything was done in a very simplified way because we had no money. <laughs> it was a fact. There was no congregation. <laughs> and so we, we made the best of whatever nature was provided by nature and by whatever came in by Krishna's arrangement. So in that way, um, it was easy. There was no Ritvik. <laughs> There was no politics, <laughs> there was no, you know. Uh, the only problems we had is to make sure that we were able to continue with the limited amount of resources we had in order to survive and to, at the same time worship the Lord nicely. And that was the foundation by which that kept us all together due to the scarcity of the material resources, because there was no hot water. Uh, I remember one story when we, I first joined, we were bathing outside in the winter. We had dug a, I was like a little gat. Devotees would come from, it was a distance away from the ashram. This was in the main farm of Ulaba. And we would go out there and bathe and break the ice <laughs> with milk buckets and throw ice cold water over us and then run as fast as you could <laughs> back to the ashram <laughs> because if you stood there trying to get dried you would freeze so. and one very wonderful devotee was living there at the time with her family she would hear screams every morning <laughs> and she was thinking what's happening somebody's getting killed or attacked but it was us bathing <laughs> Yeah, it was, you know, water was not cold, it was impossible. It's <laughs> a better word for describing what we had to go through. But the, f the fact is that that's the way it was. That's how we accepted it. And after a way, it became just a part of life. And of course, there were some of us who found it very difficult to adjust. And but most of us were really inspired by the whole idea of Srila Prabhupada's project for Vrindavan. Vrindavan. Prabhupada had said, make a new Vrindavan like Vrindavan. And so with that inspiration coming through the leaders in new Vrindavan, we were constantly in that mood to try to, Shila, to please Srila Prabhupada by having cows, protecting cows, and worshiping the Lord nicely. We had Raghavindam and Chandra at the main farm, Madhava Madhava at a smaller farm, which was just for Grihastas. There was about four or five Grihasta families living there. And then the Brahmachari farm, which was Raghavindam and Nath. So that's where I was. From. Um, I remember 1970, I, w I spent my first part of my year in the main farm. And uh was <laughs> really austere. That's the thing. <laughs> I was like, Especially we, when you cooked. 
that means that you're neutral, or are you going to say no? Is it, is it neutrality, or just I don't do it? <laughs> to your heart's content. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that means you're neutral. Then. Okay. <laughs> because certain things I say, uh, you know, just shouldn't be said in public. <laughs> so because of that scarcity, there was a, a little bit of a, you know, kind of a under ground movement that was going around to somehow get Maha <laughs> during the day. And so this is when we were at, I was at the main farm the first year. And so we had a little Maha cabinet with a padlock on it and a door. The door would open like this, big padlock. And so there were those who, for some reason, you know, we were not used to all of this denial. So we, people would find ways to try to get the maha, <laughs> even during the day. So they would try to break the lock on the maha cabinet. But that was a problem because it would deprive the devotees from getting their share. So um, then there was an instituted law that became foundational and that anyone who would be caught stealing maha would have to get married. <laughs> that was the, you might call it punishment for some and really fulfillment of desires for others. <laughs> but that, yeah, that was, that was the rule. So that went on. But that didn't discourage the underground movement. <laughs> they continued to go on. So then we thought that we have to make stronger measures. So we wrote, we put nails on the inside of the maha cabinet, and when people would try to break the door, they would pull the bottom of the door open, and then they would stick their hand in there. It would be like meeting Agasura. <laughs> nails. But that wasn't enough. <laughs> so then get a, we got a refrigerator and put chains around it with a lock. I'm not sure of the different sequences of how this played itself out. I'm sure that my Swami knows more, but he won't speak about it. <laughs> it's, maybe you will, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, the devotees were breaking the lock on the refrigerator and still stealing the lock. Every week there was a marriage. <laughs> Every week. <laughs> Sometimes two. <laughs> Then it was good because many of the ladies, because you know, the preaching in that day is stay brahmachari. That's the way it is. That's the way you get. And Prabhupada also said, of course, this was a, something he said off the cuff. He said, all the men should remain brahmachari and all the women should get married. <laughs> and then he said, and it's up to the leaders to figure out how that's going to be. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that doesn't apply to this story directly, but it's a statement. So that was the mood. Yeah. And so, but things were changing. I got called stealing Maha. <laughs> <laughs> I saw my wife the first day on the marriage, because you know, they would say, this is your wife? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I was married for like two or three days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was different. I mean, because as soon as I got married, they sent her out on Sankirtan. <laughs> and I stayed at the farm. <laughs> 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 and it's too late for that. <laughs> I wasn't here off to something. <laughs> but most of us weren't. <laughs> and so, and there was one, and then finally, of course, at one point, you know, we put the refrigerator and really put padlocks on it. 
but someone stole the whole refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> and we were construct we were doing construction, so we had dynamite there. So they blew open the refrigerator and there was dynamite there. But just to give you a small indication of how much people wanted Mahaprasha. <laughs> because our prashadam was really I mean, you might use the words austere, but simple is a, uh, also a good word to describe it. Um, things were very, very... Lunch was just you know, simple dal, rice, chapati, no vegetables. And uh, in the... That's later, when we went up to the Brahmachari ashram, we started to get a little vegetables. This was my first job. And in the evening, it was popcorn and milk. <laughs> We had many cows. So milk was, was plenty of milk. In fact, the trade devotees were drinking too much milk. And Prabhupada came, and we all were sick from too much milk, and Prabhupada said, you're drinking too much milk. <laughs> and he gave the formula. He said, no more than one pound, no less than one half pound, which if you measure, that's 17.2 ounces for a pound. And and then he said, that means all milk products. He said, milk is very good. It's nutritious. It's meant for developing higher brain of tissues in order for one to understand philosophical principles. But he said, not too much and not too little. And of course, the milk was so pure, thick, cream. It was half cream and half milk. He let it sit there and it was just, just Practically all just nice thick cream on the top. Very tasty. You wouldn't even need any any sweetener. It was so nice. So that was the opulence we had. We had many, and we made nice milk products for the deities. That became one of the focuses to really increase the quality of our worship. Is using milk to make so many nice preparations for rather than down. Nath went at the Brahmachari Ashram, rather than down in Chandra at the main farm, and rather not at the smaller farm where there were a few greenhouse the families. So, and there was one devotee, he wanted to get married, and he kept breaking into the Maha cabin to get caught. <laughs> But they knew his program, so he wouldn't get in the life. <laughs> <laughs> and so after some time, they decided, all right. And then they gave him the life. <laughs> and it's, there's more to that story, but I won't, I'll, you know, certain purports are not allowed in public. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, the, the main point that we try to illustrate is that life was quite simple and everything was focused on devotional activities. There was nothing else. And we had we only had each other. And so we tried in our best way to work together and to support each other in worshiping the deity and, and uh, just work and then uh, working together in a very cooperative way. And that was nice. That was really nice. For years, I didn't see any newspapers, no money, no electronic media, nothing. So that was nice in the sense that it helped us to, under, to focus completely on the activities of devotional service. And of course, we had our difficulties, but we accepted those things because you know, what was really important was trying to please Srila Prabhupada and trying to build with the Dhamma. And that really was the focus of everybody. And so everyone took on a lot of difficulties because the idea is we want to make New Vrindavan in such a way that Prabhupada would be attracted to come and be here and be pleased by what we, we can offer him. So that was the move. And that was the encouragement. That was done all the way from the top down. Even the leaders in the community who were working so hard in order to inspire us devotees to, you know, surrender more and more to the to the needs of worshiping the deity and keeping uh, Krishna consciousness in the center. 
And I'm sure Maharaj can tell many stories about Srila Prabhupada's visit to Mugandam and how much he was really pleased when, uh, when he came to see. He said this was actually his dream to have a, a Krishna conscious community, farming community in the Western world that would be a prototype that could expand itself out to teach a real work because one of the principles that Srila Prabhupada enunciated when he first began uh, Krishna Consciousness in 26 Second Avenue, he talked about uh, you know, establishing a more simplified lifestyle where we could bring in the, the, bring in the participants of the devotees together based on that lifestyle. So, and that helps to really minimize many of the problems, because a lot of the problems we have is that we, we have too many things to do. <laughs> and it becomes, we get diverted away from Krishna consciousness out of apparent necessaries, but when you actually see it, that a lot of these things we don't need. And, uh, it was nice. We were there for many years. And then in 1973 also, because Srila Prabhupada wanted New Vrindavan to pattern Old Vrindavan, he wanted seven temples and a smaller size version of uh, the seven original temples in Sri Vrindavan. So we began. And uh, in 1973, I remember, we went up to one hill, it was called Olindaji Hill, it was about the main community, and we started to dig uh, a footer in order to put it in the Sesha as a foundation for building that temple. And we dug a 15-foot pole deep, eight feet wide, and we had a wonderful ceremony, and we planted uh, uh, we placed there in, with the ceremony and worship and the, the Yagya Anathasesha and Balaram, the foundation for the establishment of the temple. But then the community leader, and at that time it was Kirtananda Swami, he said, how can we worship the Lord without worshiping Srila Prabhupada? And we must first do something for wonderful for Srila Prabhupada. So the idea was to build a nice house for Prabhupada. So we took our attention away from the temple and started to focus on that. And as time went on, the idea, we want to make it nicer and nicer and nicer. So then the idea was, let's build a palace for Prabhupada. <laughs> and so that's the idea of how Newton um, built Prabhupada's palace. And then all of the energy switched in order to Bill Srila Prabhupada's palace. Uh, the brahmacharis were more or less the workforce in order to establish that. And, and uh, myself and Radhanath Maharaj, he was the pujari, the brahmachari. And we had one woodcutter, and we were at the old Vrindavan farm. It was just the three of us up there all day. And the rest of the devotees would leave after breakfast and, and cross the ridge going deep into down to a valley and then coming all the way up just to get there was quite arduous and um, they would work all day building Prabhupada's palace and it wasn't easy because there wasn't so many so much skilled labor all these were reading books learning more about construction finally we, we, we uh, purchased a place in Pittsburgh and we established a marble factory and then you know, devotees were going around the world and purchasing marble in different places and bringing it back. And the, uh, the result was a wonderful offering to Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada came just before the palace was finished and he was walking. And he was smiling and devotees were showing him the different things that we had already established. Prabhupada was really acknowledging. And then, I believe it was the community leader, he said, and Prabhupada, we want to light 
this palace with so many beautiful gems to make it really bright and you know, very beautiful. And Prabhupada, he stopped and he looked and he pointed to all his devotees. He said, these are my gems, <laughs> the devotees. Yeah. And Prabhupada showed his affection for us and showing that, yeah, the devotees are the real gems because it's what the, it's the devotees that make up Krishna consciousness. So that mood was to to help us to really work together as a as a group in order to please Sri Prabhupada and build his palace and make Nirvana down in a place he can be proud of. But the lessons we can learn from that is that uh, difficulties will come. There's no question about that. This, this is the material world. Because this is the material world, there's always reverses, there's always challenges, there's always obstacles. But a devotee will see these things. I think we heard from Radhanath Maharaj last night. He gave a wonderful talk explaining how Sanatana Goswami was, you know, he was a great, you know, he was a, he was a completely pure devotee of the Lord, but yet he was put into so many difficult situations. And, but he never complained, and he, he was always using his situations to somehow or other uh, stay Krishna consciousness and also uh, expand Krishna consciousness. So that's the mood of a devotee. The devotee's thinking, Difficulties are actually opportunities in order for one to grow in Krishna consciousness. And that those difficulties help us to become a little bit more dependent on Krishna. That's the idea of becoming more dependent, praying to Krishna more for his mercy taking shelter of Krishna more by remembering Krishna more and more throughout these, what we say, challenging times. And that gives strength. And that gives enthusiasm. And that also is the success. Because the real difficulty is to forget Krishna. <laughs> the real difficulty is to somehow see oneself as the success of everything in life. Our success is how much we can serve each other and the mission of Srila Prabhupada and our spiritual master. That's our success. So these difficulties help us to become more dependent on the Lord's mercy. And they also help us to understand that we can learn something from these difficulties to move forward in our Krishna consciousness. So we try to avoid these things, but they come automatically just by province, you might say, or just by living in this world. But the devotees never discourage because as long as we stay, stay in Krishna consciousness, guarantee their success. Talk to our day home for the John Money 1980 That. Devotees accept difficulties as opportunities to become more and more serious in their practice of Krishna consciousness. I think that the greatest difficulty is that when we, when we somehow become discouraged in our execution of Krishna consciousness, help us that we cannot fail internally, from the external environment. This movement cannot be stopped but from the outside, only from the inside. So we have to stay strong in our practice. That means nice, good sadhana. That means good sadhana. Good sadhana really means to take the chanting of our grounds very seriously. Very, very seriously. It's the most, it's the foundation by which we build all of our activities in Krishna consciousness. And it's the way to purify the heart, it's the way to connect with Krishna. And it's the way to experience the happiness in Krishna consciousness. So we keep the holy name first along with the 
association and service of the devotees, that's the foundation for all our success in Krishna consciousness. And that requires some experience and some uh, some intelligence on how to do that. But by learning, by associating with each other in that mood, we can find we we can we can solve all of our problems. It's then when we somehow go out of the association of devotees, when we think we can solve all our own difficulties, then we find we get confused. We also find it becomes difficult. And what usually happens, we become a little discoveries in our execution of Krishna consciousness. Always stay in association with devotees. This is the most important part of our foundation. Prabhupada would say, three things are important in Krishna consciousness for the successful execution of Krishna consciousness. He said, association, association, association. So I'll make a note of those three. <laughs> That's how... Krishna consciousness really expands itself through associating with devotees in the mood of serving. Because if we have the mood of enjoyment, we miss the opportunity to actually benefit from that association. Okay, I won't speak too much more because this was the introduction. Now we get to the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai. first visit to this area, Elijah was in 1995, and the second visit was about five or six years ago, I came for a kirtan program, and I didn't have any place to stay, so they said, well, we have a house for you to stay in, I said, wow, a whole house, whoa, okay, so they put me there, and it had no cold water, just hot water. You know, and I, I guess because when I grew up in New Vrindavan, we had only cold water. <laughs> so now I was getting only hot water. <laughs> it was miserable. <laughs> but because it was a lot so I was thinking, okay. You lost there already.
asked her on her telephone and said, bridging the gap. <laughs> he made it. Huh? He made it. <laughs> is that what you always talk about when you meet, or is that special it's, for this? It's more the title of the kind of program, but the topic is always up to speak with really. But the, the title of that program meaning bringing together older generation and younger generation. That's, sure, like that's that. the idea, yeah. But whatever you want to share is ultimately up to you. Thank you. This generational gap we all have collective and personal experiences. May I share some of my own? I was born in 1950, that's 73 years ago, and when you're a little boy or a little girl, you're just playing and trying to learn, you don't notice so much of a gap, but when I became a teenager, it was the 1960s, and it was a serious generation gap. <laughs> and I couldn't find any bridges anywhere. <laughs> um, it was a time when our parents couldn't understand us. At least we didn't think so. And we couldn't really understand our parents. Most of our parents, they were brought up in the Great Depression. Do any of you know American history, what the Great Depression was? Practically the whole America was in dire poverty. Many of the banks went bankrupt. People gave all their money and then it was gone. Couldn't get anything back. Huge unemployment. And you know, my father and mother had to leave school when they were like 15 just to work full time to, just for the family could eat. It was difficult times. You know, when they got jobs and worked and struggled and strived, and they knew what suffering was. They wanted to raise a family where their children didn't have to suffer and struggle the way they did, which means, you know, having some comforts and food. <laughs> And their children, as we were growing up, we didn't have a lot, but we had. So we didn't really think working hard and making money was very meaningful at all. We thought our parents were materialistic. But actually, they grew up without it, and they suffered, and they didn't want us to suffer. So they kind of thought we were, why are you criticizing us for working all day and night to make money? We're doing it for you, and we couldn't appreciate it. I'm not just talking about a few people, but it was a large segment of the whole generation that we grew up with. Another gap was um, I guess it was 1941 my parents were just in their 20s 
um, the United States Navy was bombed. And there was a war in Europe and a war in the Pacific. And America entered World War II. My parents and so many in my generation, um, their uncles, aunts, and cousins were being put in concentration camps in Europe and literally exterminated. Every one of my relatives was killed if that didn't come to America before that. So World War II was very meaningful. There's a lot of patriotism. And almost all men, they weren't getting drafted, they were volunteering. They wanted to fight for their country. They wanted to fight for freedom. They really wanted to fight for justice. So there was a patriotism. In my generation, in the 60s, there was this Vietnam War which really didn't make any sense at all. It seemed like we were violating other people's freedom. And there didn't seem to be any justice involved. And yet the whole generation was being drafted and told you either go and fight and kill these people or you will go to jail. It was a federal offense to not go. And if you don't go, you're not going to get an education and you're not going to get a good job because you're going to have after jail. At the same time, you know, as television was kind of growing, at the beginning it was just black and white television and there was in Chicago area where I grew up, there was four stations. And there was no television from like 11 o'clock at night till about six in the morning. It was just like this, um, nothing. <laughs> and then it would start. Um, but as the news was starting to come and and in our own life, you know, my parents were struggling somewhat and I had a job when I was 15 and everybody else in the job was like my parents' age and they were African Americans on the south side of Chicago. They really lived in poverty. And they were who I was working with from 15 on. And the civil rights issue was not just a theory or an idea. People I loved were really suffering because they just did not have rights. There was so much resistance. And it seemed like the government itself was not giving the, the facilities where people could grow just because of a different color skin, a different background. This was so wrong. And being idealistic as a teenager, as I grew into these years, a huge sentiment of my whole generation we blamed our parents' generation for this Vietnam War where our friends were being killed for nothing. And we blamed our parents because they were patriotic for the injustices of minorities. To be a civil rights activist was many, in many ways blaming the previous generation for what they left us. Those counter 
counterculture. You've heard of that word? In the 60s, there was the counterculture, which really means the younger generation encountering, <laughs> demonstrating and fighting against what the older generation represented to them. And many of our parents, they weren't prejudiced. In fact, you know, my own parents, they were discriminated against like anything but when they grew up. But still, we blame them for the civil rights war because we, there was this dynamics of the younger generation battling against we considered the problems of the world and we blamed it all on our parents' generation. And we had each other, we had our peers, because they were the only people who could really understand us. But the problem was we didn't even understand ourselves. <laughs> it was um, our parents' generation stereotyped us and we stereotyped them without really understanding the depths of the feelings that each side were having and the communication was very, very difficult. So at a certain time, yes, we, you know, we had each other as a generation where we kind of bonded and we had our ideologies and we had our demonstrations and we had our marches and we, and, um, we had our music which promoted all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Not only promoted it, it, it fueled mm -hmm. the anger, the frustration with what was going on in the world and the previous generation for what they left us. Are you still awake? <laughs> so uh, many of your parents or grandparents who are here today, that was a generation that, of our experience. And myself, I, I was reading a lot of books, you know, from revolutionary people. And what made the most sense to me was, if you don't understand, if you, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. And most of the revolutionary people that were really like the idols, they all had a spiritual purpose. And I was seeing so much even in the generation of ourselves, of the counterculture and civil rights, I saw a lot of hypocrisy among ourselves. In the sense that we were fighting against problems, but individually and collectively, we, we, we seem to have the same problems, but just in a different, a different dress, according to time. There was still greed. There was still arrogance. There was still all this lust to enjoy and other people are in our way. So I came to the conclusion, I have to find a solution spiritually. So basically, I found a, not only a gap in the generation of my parents and grandparents, but I landed in a, in a gap with my own generation. And I, I left home and went to Europe trying to find maybe another culture in another place isn't like this. <laughs> I was searching. <clears throat> If any of you read this um, very uh, unusual, strange 
book called The Journey Home. <laughs> you may have read part of this. But uh, I was traveling around searching for meaning and purpose and to find where where I am meant to be in the, all these gaps. And I realized more and more that the only real gap there was between was between me and God. <laughs> that was the real gap. And how am I going to find that bridge? <clears throat> So I, I hitchhiked across Europe and through the Middle East and came to India. I was still a teenager. I was 19 when I arrived in India. Um, and I was a spiritual seeker. I would be going through jungles in Himalayas and different villages and towns. And actually, the only people that I, I ever associated with for over a year was people either my grandparents or parents' age. And they were all from India. <clears throat> I felt kind of like I can identify no white people. <laughs> No one my own age, no one even in my own generation. I was just with these old Indian sadhus. Mm. I was traveling with them and learning from them. And, um, yeah, there was a total gap with anybody in my own age from my own place. But I was. You know, in, in the disconnects from all that stuff of my past, I was really, I had no alternative but to find myself. And that's, that was my life. I was learning from people, most 60s, 70s, 80s, everybody I was living with and learning from. And they just saw me as in those days, there wasn't many foreigners going to India. So they, they were very nice, very kind to me. And that was my life. In one sense, that was the generation I felt happy with. Because they were renounced people who were seeking God. And after quite a while of traveling to holy places like this, I came to Bombay and there was a Hare Krishna festival. And I never heard of Hare Krishnas. I didn't know what a Hare Krishna was. I never met devotees actually. And I just I went there because I thought it was spiritual. And there, there was Americans and Europeans my age who were all singing and dancing. And, and, and I was thinking I could never, it actually, because they were all Western people my own age, really turned me off. <laughs> <laughs> language I was really like gapped out. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sri Prabhupada came on stage and I was thinking I'm willing to tolerate all these other people. I, I had nothing against them. I just could not identify anything with them. But Sri Prabhupada was so Kind. He was so compassionate and he was so deeply embodying this spirit of love for God. I, I stayed on in the festival just to be with him. 
And the devotees really thought I was in Maya. <laughs> so I had long matted hair. And I remember one devotee asked me, it's like my age. He asked me, what books are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm reading a book called The Crest Jewel of Discrimination by Shankaracharya. Mm. Did you ever hear of Shankaracharya? He looked at me and said, do you know what Shankaracharya taught? I said, well, I'm reading his book. <laughs> <laughs> Worship Govinda, worship Govinda, worship Govinda, you fools and asses. <laughs> and I was thinking, yeah, I'm just meeting this person. <laughs> I'm and an ass. <laughs> you know, he was an American book, man, you know, about my age. And I was just, um, anyways, that was what it was like. <laughs> people in the crowd and when he was leaving the stage I went to touch his feet and one of um, who later became my god brothers when I went to touch he said don't nobody touches Prabhupada's feet and he said it like a thunderbolt of chastisement and there's like 30,000 people watching <laughs> that's how many people were in the audience and I felt mortified. I just did something really wrong. Mm. And then I looked up at Sri Prabhupada because I was on my knees. And he smiled at me. And he said, You can't touch my feet. <laughs> Mostly because we were the same age. 
and we were from the same places. <laughs> so they were telling me I was in Maya for living in Vrindavan. Some were saying I'm a Sahaja, some, so many things. Because if you want, you should surrender to Prabhupada and travel with us. And actually I was surrendering to Prabhupada, but I didn't think they understood me. But they were really putting pressure on me, some of them. And one day, Shilpa was walking from this event in, in a little forest area of Vrindavan, and I bowed down to him, as so many others were, Vrindavasi people. And Prabhupada stopped and said, how long have you been living in Vrindavan? And I was thinking, the devotees must have told him <laughs> that I'm living in Vrindavan, because they didn't like me there. And I thought Prabhupada was going to chastise me. And I had already in my heart accepted him as my spiritual master forever. And I was kind of, I was trembling. And I said, I've been here about six months, Shiva Prabhupada. And he looked at me very grave, very intense. And he smiled. And he rubbed my head again. <laughs> and I was on my knees and he was standing. And he said, very nice. Vrindavan is such a nice place. <laughs> <laughs> and then he walked away. <laughs>
and I didn't know how I could live with them. So, um, it was a lot of challenges, actually. And of course, Chandra Mali Maharaj was, was explaining what it was like at New Vrindavan. But one of the strange things that people saw about me, it was so austere when he was saying what devotees were eating and cold baths and, and no facilities. But f compared to the way I was living in Vrindavan in the Himalayas, <laughs> it was sex gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember, I, I told the leader of the community, I'm leaving. And he said, why are you, this was even before Prabhupada came. I said, I'm leaving. I, I don't, and he said, why are you leaving? And I said, because there's too much sense gratification. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, he knew I was serious. And I said, yeah, you get popcorn, that's sense gratification. <laughs> and skim milk, that's really, you know, when I was doing madhukari, you know, begging, I would, we would just get like some dry rotis. Or, <laughs> and um, I was sleeping under trees here. There's actually, you could, sleep inside. <laughs> um, he looked at me and he said, you are the first person in the history of New Vrindavan to ever leave for that reason. <laughs> and then he chastised me, which kind of was I was accustomed to. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Srila Prabhupada said, if you can best serve your spiritual master sleeping under a tree and you're attached to a palace. No, he said, if you're living in a palace and you can best serve your guru, Srila Prabhupada, by, by living under a tree, then it's Maya to sleep in the palace. But if you're living under a tree and you can best serve your guru living in a palace, then it's sense gratification to live under a tree. <laughs> he said, your he said your Maya and sense gratification is you're materially attached to trees. <laughs> <laughs> Now I was like about 21 or 22, and I was thinking, they just don't understand it. <laughs> but actually, they understood me better than I did. But I stayed, and then Srila Prabhupada came, and I was thinking that In my own heart, this gun was so dear to Srila Prabhupada. You know, it was his, I, the way I was understanding and the way he was speaking, it was, it was his life contribution to our parampara to, to, to have to create a movement that would. Um, spread pure unalloyed devotion and service in the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sri Sri Radha Govinda of Vrindavan throughout the world. So somehow or other, if I want to please Sri Prabhupada, it, it sends gratification just to be with all the people I want to be with, the sadhus in India. And, uh, I'm going to try to stay here unless he tells me to go somewhere else. And honestly, it was really hard 
because I couldn't relate to anybody. And people really thought I was strange because I actually was. <laughs> but as time went on in devotional service, those same people became my dear most best friends. Dear most best friends. Um, and even though we had so many differences in so many ways and different backgrounds and I just wanted to be with these God brothers and God sisters for my whole life forever. Because it wasn't, our relationship was not based on anything superstitious, superficial. It was based on learning to know each other and love each other. Because our purpose in life was to love Krishna love Srimati Radharani and to, to please Srila Prabhupada. Um, I was sent to live on the mountain the first day I arrived at New Vrindavan and everybody else except six people were living at Bukhula Park. And they sent me up there so I wouldn't um, contaminate the people in the community. <laughs> it's like high agreement for you know, very senior people living up there. And um, some months later, maybe five months later, I was brought to Bahulaban. And after a while, His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj came. And I was I was still not initiated, and I still had long hair when you came. <laughs> um, and if, in New Vrindavan, for, for me, living in Brahmacharya, there was no combs or brushes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was no mirrors. So I don't know what I look like. <laughs> But I do know after taking cold baths in the winter, my my hair would have a whole layer of ice on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go like... <laughs> 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 uh, six baths a day. <laughs> in the, and that was his 
name was not His Holiness Chandramani Swami. He was also not initiated. And <clears throat> I would milk the cows and bring the milk to him. And he was in charge of making the milk into butter. Do you know how to make butter? How many of you have made butter? Amazing. Well, you may have more modern technology than you. <laughs> <laughs> Chandramali Swami Maharaj would just let the milk sit and then he would scoop off the cream, right? Like from the day before. And then he would he would churn the cream. He had a he had this piece of wood with like something at the end of it, like another just it was just a piece of wood that was flat on the bottom. <clears throat> and he would be sitting there just like this. <laughs> For hours he would just go. <laughs> and with all respect, Maharaj, um, <laughs> whatever you say is true. <laughs> you know, I'd come in there with the milk to drop it off and he would go. And um, it seemed like half the time he was sleeping. He <laughs> <laughs> used one extra word, seemed. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I probably couldn't recognize it as some <laughs> Everybody had to chant all the rounds before Mangalarti. There was zero japa time after the morning program. And there was no japa session. Mangalarti, some, some seasons it was 4 o'clock and some seasons 4.30. And there was Mangalarti, Tulsi Puja, Srimad Bhagavatam class, Guru Puja, and then you go for whatever breakfast he was talking about. <laughs> and then by seven in the morning, you're out for work. And, and there was no moments for Japa. So you had to get all 16 rounds done before Mangalarti. Remember, we all, most devotees would get up between two and 2.30. So we didn't get much sleep. So I was wondering, and just <laughs> all alone. <laughs> there were no cassette tape players. We, we, didn't have, we couldn't afford those where you're listening to tapes of lectures and there was nobody else in the room. He's just. Like that. 
so I would bring him the milk and he would make it into butter. He used to call me Mother Misova. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would, we would read Krishna book and Yashoda and I would be churning butter. And, and here I was seeing with my own eyes what she used to do. <laughs> and somehow or other, I was trying to connect it with Krishna book. <laughs> relationship as God brothers and friends began in a very, very simple way. And um, you know, neither of us were initiated. Neither of us had any say about anything except, you know, I would shovel the dung and milk the cows and he would make butter. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but then the world changes. And at that time, we thought we would never, we would just be doing this until we die. Mm -hmm. I would picture him like as a really old man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how when I'm an old man, how I probably have to take like you know, this much milk at a time. You know, to lift the container. Because um, I didn't know what it was doing anyway. <laughs> but then we were, we got in the shade a few weeks later, and we were sent up to Ramacharya Ashram in the mountain, and, and he told about some of his experiences with Mahaprasad and the reactions. <laughs> And we didn't see each other for some years, actually, because he was living at Bhagavan and I was up in the mountain. And then Everything we, that Maharaj wrote in his book, I heard before the book came out. Every day he would tell his stories about his experiences in India. And he had that longing to return. Yeah. <laughs> But then, you know, he, he came back up to Vrindavan after Mangalananda Prabhu. Mangalananda Prabhu was the cook up there, and I was the pujari, and just the two of us were up there. And in those days, we rarely had woodcutters. We had to do ourselves. And then Chandramali Maharaj came back up, and he was the cook, and I was the pujari. And he was cooking with wood. And because the wood, those rarely woodcutters, most of the wood was wet. It was hard to find dry. You know, people would just bring in some stuff and we'd have to chop it with axes. And it made probably 75% smoke and 25% fire. <laughs> And he was in this, like, a underground, um, it was a dungeon. Yeah. It was a dungeon. <laughs> that was the kitchen. The kitchen. We used to call it the dungeon. <laughs> that was the name. And about every 10 days, I would have to cook all the offerings myself, along with all the six offerings and six arches and dressing the deities twice a day and everything, because his eyes, would be so, whoever the cook was, it was like this. Their eyes from the smoke would be in such unbearable pain. They actually went blind. I did. You, uh, about every two weeks, you, you had to rest. Oh, yeah. I actually went blind. <laughs> and they called in an Ayurvedic doctor. And I, you know, I also had to do RT once in a while and just to go on the altar. And the lights were so bright. I couldn't look up. I was doing archie like this because of the brightness. So they thought, I think they should help, help Chandramani a little bit here. So they called him a doctor, Ayurvedic doctor, and he said, you take honey, you take water, warm water, and you mix it, and you put it on your eye, and you close your eye, and you do it three times a day. And I did. My eyes came back. <laughs> 
he identified himself with each letter of the well wishes. So as fallen as we may be, um, we're trying to assist Srila Prabhupada in his being an ever well wisher, which means our service really is to be well wishers on his behalf. And, you know, through all the generational and cultural gaps that really traumatized me in many ways in my life. Um, this became the principle that Sri Prabhupada wants us to be well-wishers for each other, all of us, with our faults, with our defects, with our shortcomings. And if another person has strengths, we don't become envious of them. To be a well-wisher means we're happy with their strengths, we're happy with their successes. Mm. And we're trying to be understanding where, where we find weaknesses or shortcomings. And that's what it means to be a well-wisher. Sri Prabhupada's our ever well-wisher. We're just trying to share that spirit on behalf of Sri Prabhupada. And when we, when we focus on that, um, the bond of friendship is, it's, it's transcendental. It's beyond the inebriates of this world. Thank you, Maharaj, for being a well <laughs> special. You know, even if I, he's always encouraging me. <clears throat> anything, anything good I could ever do, um, he's always happy. And any mistakes that I make, he's always More than covered, thank you. More than covered means I spoke too long. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Maharaj. Thank you. 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 Th
is through tapasya that we achieve realization that we're not this body with the eternal souls and that we're loving servants eternally through the Supreme Personality of God in Sri Krishna. Tapasya doesn't mean just taking cold baths. It means we accept what's favorable to please Krishna and we we leave aside what's unfavorable. Um, but what oh, these Christians have a girl. focus is how we progress. And we want to help others. But if we want a spiritual empowerment to help people spiritually, then real compassion begins with we have to choose to make a connection with Krishna within our own hearts so that we can help others. How many of you drive cars? Please raise your hand. How many drive electric cars? Gasoline cars. Okay. Or if you drive gasoline cars or electric cars, you could drive and you could get to where you're going. But you have to stop to either recharge or refuel. If you don't, and you have, it's not that you just do it once. <laughs> and then you, if you're driving from Alachua, Florida to um, Seattle, Washington, that's a few thousand miles. You know, probably a couple times a day you have to stop. Even though you like just driving and it seems like you're not you're not making as much progress. When you're driving and you're going 65 or 70 miles an hour, you really may think you're making progress. Why should I stop? Mm. And with electric cars, you have to stop for like a half hour to get a recharge. Gasoline. But if you're not refueled, mm -hmm. you can't keep going. So sometimes we get so caught up with, with our life, maybe our studies, our career, our relationships, whatever, or even our service. Mm. We don't understand the importance that we need to spiritually be recharged. Mm. And that's what our sadhana is. Mm. Sadhana is a time when we, we actually have to stop everything else we're doing. Mm. And that's actually what's hard about sadhana is you have to stop everything else that you, that you may like to do or be passionate to do or feel obliged to do. Mm. And, just, and just be with Krishna, be with Krishna's holy names, be with Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimad Prabhupada's Prabhupada's be with the deities. <laughs> um, in order to be spiritually empowered, charged, this is really important. And then we have, if we do it with the right consciousness, I'm not just doing this because I have to, I'm doing this because this is but this is where I'm dedicating a time of my life to be charged with Krishna's grace. Just everything else is gone and just that connection with Krishna. 
and then with whatever else I do and whoever I'm with, I could I could share that connection. When we're having kirtan, we charge in our sex. But to charge ourselves to the optimum of how we can best serve others, help others, and be the best we can be for the world around us. You know, the, the, the scriptures and our gurus, Shri Prabhupada, our founder Acharyas, giving us instructions of how we should charge ourselves. And you know, it's, if you want to charge an electric car or put gasoline in, in a gas car, you don't just put it anywhere you like. You have to follow the manufacturer's manual, that's the instruction manual. So how to be charged? There's kirtan, mm. there's japa, mm -hmm. there's classes on Gita and Bhagavatam, we're studying, putting time aside according to the manual that ultimately is coming from Krishna. <laughs> Um, it makes everything else we do, when we do it in the right consciousness, sincerely, and take responsibility, then that's tapasya. Mm -hmm. You know, some people, the ecstasy of their day is chanting japa. When I was a teenager, I was actually 20 at the time, I was living in the place for several months with one of Srila Prabhupada's god brothers. His name was Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj. And he would sit in the temple for three hours, three or four hours every day with a little Murdanga just chanting all by himself. And because I had typhoid fever, I was just sitting with him for four months every day, just sitting there. And all the rest of the day he was chanting Japa. And sometimes in the middle of the night when I would have to go to the latrine, I would walk by his room and hear him, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. And, um, you know, he told me when he was asked, um, it wasn't an austerity for him. It was like a great austerity for him to do anything else. <laughs> because he was just feeling the presence of Radha Govinda in the holy names. And he just loved it. He just higher taste. So whether we're doing it to purify ourselves, or whether we're chanting as an expression of love in a pure state, mm. Because we have made loving Krishna and being an instrument of Krishna's love with our families and with the world, our purpose, then we actually take responsibility to his favor. And that's really what sadhana is. It's, it's giving us a special connection of Krishna's grace, our Guru's grace, Srila Prabhupada's grace, that we die grace of the whole parampara that we can share with each other and share with the world. But that doesn't work unless we sincerely um, sincerely discipline ourselves to live with good character. In, in many ways, the younger generation from our generation, I see in certain ways a special wisdom that all of you have. Because, you know, there are, as we all know, there are examples of people who may have been very strict with sadhana, but did not live with Vaishnav character. Of character really means to really care about uplifting others, to really 
be thinking of oneself as serpent. And Prabhupada said, he was asked, how do we know who is a devotee? He said, because they are perfect ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Because he was speaking to somebody that was the language they understood. In other words, they live with Vaishnav character. And when we read Srimad Bhagavatam and Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, what is the character of those devotees? They're really compassionate, they really care. They don't unnecessarily um, criticize each other or hurt each other or selfishly um, neglect each other or just speak of abuse each other. And in many ways, because some of you are second, third generation, you know, you, you got to see something we didn't. Devotees who may you know, be doing a lot of um, sadhana and service, who may be abusive or intolerant or unforgiving or um, mean or uncaring or neglectful. not really capturing Srila Prabhupada's spirit of if you're my servant then you have to help me be a well-wisher for everyone. <laughs> and when we see that where the very activities that are supposed to make us kind and compassionate and, and, and um, you know tolerant of Mm. of an artist in ourselves mm. so that we do the right we choose the right way to care about others when we see one without the other it's actually really a challenge to our faith does the process even work mm. and if we're devotees and we're not and we're abusive we're not living with proper character we will challenge people's faith. Does it even work? And we have seen you know, many tragedies among devotees in our generation. And for us, it's tragedies maybe of seniors or peers. But for you, it's, it's a generation that, that gave birth to you and, and nourished you throughout your, you know, your childhood. So yes, you know, the, I, I really do sympathize and empathize and relate to that challenge. And rationally, there really are many ways we could justify morally, ethically, socially, why we want to withdraw. But still, you know, what is the goal of life and who am I? What is the beauty and love of Krishna and Sri Radha? Um, That's a challenge to actually seek the essence and find shelter in those people who are seeking the essence among our seniors, among our peers, among our juniors. <laughs> that like minded um, seeking that essence of love for Krishna just. You know, even though all this other stuff may be around us or have been around us. And that essence is to help each other to value Vaishnav character, compassion, 
integrity. My strong sometimes tend, sometimes we do well and sometimes not so well. But we, we, we need to help each other to, to seek the essence and help each other in whatever situation as far as possible. Because at the beginning there's faith. And in many ways, every stage of advancement in bhakti is strengthening and deepening our faith. That Krishna's all merciful. Krishna's the supreme personality of God. And that loving devotional service is the means by which we can please him and be with him. So that like-minded association and that seeking the essence is like a compass that can help us make spiritual and emotional devotional progress when it's a very calm sea, or whether, or, or times when it's very dark, stormy seas with thunderbolts and lightning and, and sharks circling around us. But Shri Prabhupada was on Jalatuta. Later on, he said, when there was really big storms and huge waves, and he was in the middle of the Arabian Sea, which as far as you could see, there's just water. He said, I felt that the boat was like a little matchbox being tossed away, tossed around by the waves in the ocean. Mine is very strong. Beloved God Sister Supada Devi. I think she's leading the Vaishnav care of Sangha here at Uralnarati. And um, please, if, if you have time, talk to her and be connected in, in this effort as a community to really try to care for each other. Lord Chaitanya is the ideal devotee. We were speaking um, a couple days ago. When, his, when the other devotees would come to Puri, he didn't just lead them in kirtan. He arranged comfortable residential quarters for each devotee. You know, it's kind of physical. You know, that means he was taking, he was really caring about their bodies. <laughs> mm. And I've heard so many beautiful stories about Srila Prabhupada. One of my godbrothers, he had like a, a very, um, he had an infection and he was limping. In Mayapur, oh, yeah. during Srila Prabhupada's Guru Puja, mm -hmm. they were often Guru Puja to Srila Prabhupada and his Vyasa son. Hundreds of devotees are chanting Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada. Each devotee is coming and offering flowers to him. And this one devotee offered a flower, and Srila Prabhupada called him over and said, What happened to your leg? He said, I have this infection. Srila Prabhupada was dictating to him an, an Ayurvedic way, you know, you you mix turmeric and, and some other spices and water and you put a little ghee in it and then you boil it for some and then you apply it. And he's saying this, he's whispering in this person's ear, Tarikuru Puja. 
everyone's glorifying him and he's concerned with the bodily pain of one simple devotee. So yes, I should have character is we care about the bodies of other devotees. We do everything we can to, to help them be happy in, in Krishna consciousness. And emotionally, if we read Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Srimad Bhagavad, how devotees are concerned with each other's feelings, actually. Amanina Manadena, the very basis of a Vaishnava is be respectful to others. I encourage them. I understand that. That's my shift character. And of course, it's all ultimately for the purpose of awakening of the love of Krishna that is our greatest potential and our only happiness and the only thing that's actually real. If we separate encouraging and inspiring by our example, by our words for other people to deepen their faith and their devotion, then their physical bodies and their emotional states are all um, just wonderful vehicles to bring them to this destination. In certain ways, where there's heartbreak, there's also opportunity. Um, if we've been, if we felt, if we have felt the pain of disappointment, of course, there's always the justice to protect people from those types of disappointment. But also, I know what it's like. I don't want to do this to somebody else. I know what they're going through. And I'm going to give them that inspiration, that encouragement by which, you know, their faith could grow even in a crisis. Because I know what it's like to go through that crisis. section of my shift character. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. right. well, to be honest, I don't even remember your question. <laughs> <laughs> said in relationship was how to encourage others, right? That was yeah, how, how to care for others, how to help them to connect with their true self. There's so many people that can be such a, a daunting task. I would love to serve others. I think Maharaj was, said many things, but he hit on the essential point is take time and uh, encourage them in a way that they can be encouraged. Look, look for the good qualities and then try to bring out those good qualities even more. When we find fault or criticize others, it just makes them either defensive or unhappy. It doesn't really help to bring out the, the solution to the problem. When I was, I would spend time with Bhakti Tirtha Swami, and he was really good with helping people. I would see devotees would, I would be outside his room, and devotees would come, sometimes one, sometimes a group. And then they would come out and they would be really enlivened and inspired. So one time I asked him, I said, what do you tell them? <laughs> 
He said, I don't say much. And I said, I just listen. I want to be heard. I want somebody to, that cares for them. And we care. We actually do care. That was the point you made. But in caring, he allows them to express themselves. And by that expression, they feel that somebody cares. They take, by taking that time, by taking that uh, concern, they can feel that. Um, and that's, you know, in, the, in this age that we live in where so many things are going on, we have so many things to do. We have to make time to do that. And it's become something that we have to really put our concentration. Because actually, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says a very powerful statement. At first I couldn't understand it, but then after thinking about it, he says, the person who takes time on a one-to-one -one basis, this is a paraphrase, can do more good than the platform speaker. He uses that word. In other words, taking time individually has more long-term effect in helping people. And he uses a comparison and then giving a lecture. Of course, we do that, and that's also important and has its benefits. But then when, when something is done in that way, people, they want to be cared for, especially when they have problems. And that's the most important thing, to be there, to, be, to give that care. And a lot of times, you don't do really much. You just allow, allow them to express themselves. And a lot of times, they find the answers to their own problems just by expressing themselves. And many that many times that's the problem. They don't have an opportunity to really express themselves in the way, the way they want to. So just, and I saw that with Radhanath Maharaj, he does that all the time. He, he gives quality time to people on a day-to-day -day basis and, on, and on, in, a, in a, a very, what we say, deliberate way, he'll take time with people. And that's that's our that's our movement. Personal, very personal. And that allows people to, you know, feel important, feel concerned. That's very important. You know, and bringing person out of their you know struggles, or even out of their depressions and whatever problems they're having. Half of the solution, maybe even more, is just taking the time for others. And not finding fault, but picking up the good qualities and enhancing that. Association with devotees, you can do it for hours and hours and hours and hours. This is a well wisher. <laughs> <laughs> My nature is always to find a cave to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps there's one more pressing question. Or... Is there a pressing question? <laughs> You're not the second generation. <laughs> Yes, please. Sorry. You're like, like the queen of the second generation. <laughs> well, thank you both for for what you shared, especially the last bits really touched my heart. And um, my question is, you were both you were both speaking about the simplicities and complexities that you've experienced in your youth, and then. Uh, in your friendship and in this kind of like that and how to carry on um, looking for the good, encouraging others. What keeps you encouraged in your devotional service um, and fixed on your sadhana after having experienced so many rising and falling and com 
complexities within ISKCON and how do you um, choose to lead um, with that compassion and how can we follow in your footsteps? His Holiness Chandra Mohan Maharaj quoted Srila Prabhupada in three principles association, association, and association. To seek the association of people who encourage our faith, who encourage our determination to follow. And The austerity of not subjecting ourselves to the inevitable presence of association of people who are um, who are diminishing our faith, our determination, and our enthusiasm. Of course, we've talked about sadhana and all that, um, but in order to really do it, we need association of people who who exemplify and who encourage and who also are, are, are trying for that same essence that we're trying for. Association is so very important who we choose to associate with, both in our physical proximity and there's whole varieties on the internet and everything of what we want to associate with. And um, we need to choose that association that will nourish our bhakti, not um, harm our bhakti. Nourish our striving for real Vaishnav qualities and not distract us from or justify other things. Does that kind of answer your question? Some of it, yeah. And how, how can we take on the baton of leadership in that role um, of seeking the essence of uh, living compassionately, of giving our ear and our time to others, and really adelantando? Mm, mm, Moving, moving that movement forward the way Prabhupada envisioned, or the way you you both envisioned. Shri Prabhupada told us that we will make advancement in Krishna consciousness in proportion to how we accept responsibility. We have our own personal responsibility when we take initiation, it's not that at initiation there's just like a thunderbolt of liberating energy that comes to us. Sri Prabhupada would explain initiation means the beginning. <laughs> we take vows, and on one level, the taking of the vows is to impress upon ourselves how we how responsible we are following the process of devotion and service. And to guard against the ten offenses to the holy names, that's very much a part of our um, initiation. We're taking a vow to really try to strive to follow these principles. And in certain ways, and this I'm giving what I the way I see it, Formed this ISKCON for us. It's the house that he built. It's his movement. And with all its faults and all the tragedies it's gone through, um, for many of us, whatever may have been or whatever may be, we're taking responsibility to, to assist our gurus 
of Trina Prabhupada in making everything the best it can be. We take response, a, a good mother and father takes responsibility. Krishna has entrusted this child to me. It's not a matter of just what I feel like or what I don't feel like. It's a matter of what is best for this child. That's responsible. A husband and wife take responsibility for each other, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. A disciple takes responsibility to follow the, 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 the spiritual principles as well as assist in the mission. We're taking responsibility to assist with the mission of our gurus. And as a movement, we're all trying to take responsibility in whatever role we are to help sure the problems to be fulfilled. So, um, yes, the sense of responsibility comes down to the choices we make, our lifetime choices, which are expressed in our moment-to-moment -moment choices. I think yeah. the principle of taking responsibility also is based on the, the gratefulness that we can ex have for what we've been giving. And when we look around and we think about it, to have, you know, come in contact with Srila Prabhupada's movement, come in contact with the, the process of pure devotional service, which is the process by which we can fulfill all of our desires and ultimately return to Krishna in the spiritual world. The association of devotees, the, the, the beautiful deities that we have, so many things that have been given to us. There's a sense of gratefulness that should arise from understanding how much we've been blessed with all of this. And that alone will help us to inspire to take on more responsibility. We want to give something back. We want to reciprocate. Prabhupada's given me so much, my spiritual master, association of devotees. I have so much, I've been given so much. I've been benefited by just by, just by being in this movement in so many ways. Let me somehow or other re reciprocate. And that's just natural when we actually are grateful. When we're grateful, that sense of responsibility also comes automatically. We want to do something to show our gratitude. So when we think, yeah, association of wonderful devotees, you know, Shiva Prabhupada's books, <laughs> which are just treasure house of philosophical knowledge and Practically every subject under the sun that is there is discussed in relationship to Krishna. So much that we've been given. It's like, if we're not inspired to give back, then we're not really understanding what we've been given. We've all been given so much. <laughs> Just to come in contact with Shiva Prabhupada and, and this movement is is so rare and so valuable and it's the, the principle of ultimate happiness and success in life. But that's rare to have that opportunity. So when we reflect on that and think, oh yes, I mean I I think if I didn't become you know, if I didn't take up Krishna consciousness and didn't have the opportunity to meet devotees and get involved in Krishna. Uh, you know, I, I, would be, I wouldn't even be here right now. I'd be finished. I would have died long ago. That's a fact. You know, that I understood by my experiences. So this movement is just so rare and so special. And Jila Prabhupada made it even sweeter by his mercy. And 
and then he's he's representing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, <laughs> who is in Karuna Avatar, Namo Mahavadanai Krishna Premapadaya Te Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namari Gauda Trishtena Maha. And Lord Chaitanya is so kind, <laughs> so merciful. He is allowing us to perform this, I mean, difficult process of self-realization in such an easy and wonderful way. So that's, that's a lot of mercy given to us. So we should be thankful for that. And that thankfulness is the inspiration for keeping us inspired to do more and more in Krishna consciousness. Especially giving that same opportunity to others, which is the perfection of our way to show gratefulness. Is that okay? Thank you very very much. Thank you.